library because it's great. I like the library because there is there's a lot of books. My favorite book is Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Um, my favorite book would probably have to be Ella Enchanted by Gail Carson Levine. I like many different kinds of books, and I like being in the library because it's peaceful and quiet. My name is Yuk Jun Kang. Uh, I was born in South Korea and I grew up there until 24 years old. I moved to New York in uh, 1984. When I came to this new country, uh, I was uh, going to school. I was trying to find the time to paint. And then really, uh, uh, because I had two jobs and then full-time school, hardly ever, ever had a time to paint. So I decided to make a small canvas and then uh, carry with me, you know, when I take a train, when I take a bus. Then I just started painting. So first one year I made about 1,000 small uh, paintings. And then so far I've made about uh, 100,000 paintings and joints and small sculptures. Two years ago, 2001 actually, there was an installation at the United Nations building. I sent all the letters to children in uh, different countries uh, asking their dreams. And then they sent me back all the, uh, with their beautiful drawings. We are here to uh, collect all the uh, objects from community. The, the object can be used for our installation. We had a great staff, you know. We have uh, great friends. I mean, became friends after starting uh, this mural project. People from library, people from community become, you know, one team. So we just, you know, just kind of uh, saying our own ideas. Every, every individual idea has uh, you know, their own you know, life. It's really fun to learn each other, and then uh, I'm not a really uh, just creator, but I'm just as an observer, also as a spectator. It's more like a, a chef at the kitchen, in a way. So people, community, they provide already all the ideas, and then all the uh, objects, and the energy. Energy is most important, actually. The enthusiasm is important. Then I'm just, you know, I'm the guy who brought this, all this to my kitchen and trying to mix it up. So I don't know what kind of uh, energy and uh, taste will, will come out, but I never know, actually. I have been mostly a printmaker before. For most of my years, um, I have done printmaking and I've worked with mesh layers. Well, uh, when they came to me to ask me to do a proposal, 
um, I immediately thought of a book. If I could make it appealing to look deeper and deeper and deeper um, the way it is with a book. The farther you get in, the more you get uh, sort of the feeling of the mystery and you want to know more and, and it, it grips you as you go further. Oh, living in Japan was um, a wonderful experience for both my husband and myself. I loved the simplicity of so much of their cultural um, traditions. When I got back to my work, nothing seemed to work right at all. And everything I did seemed complicated too complicated and I kept pulling shapes away, pulling shapes away and finally something began to happen that was much simpler. That influence of simplicity stays with me and I'm very happy about that. I didn't try to make it happen but it just did become a part of my work. We had a chance to go to see the site after they put um, the drywall up and they discovered that we could have four more inches width, which uh, is good for the composition, I think. And yet, when I used those dimensions, they didn't seem quite right. So I had to keep playing with the proportions on this one, and I think it's getting pretty close to what it should be. A symbolism of what happens when you get into a book, and then how much more involved you get the deeper you go. And I wanted that to be something that would lure people to love books all the more, if this could symbolize that. Hi, I'm Buzz Spector, and I'm um, one of the artists involved in the Princeton Library Project. Uh, my contribution to the library is a book, and this seems very appropriate. Uh, most of my art is concerned with books, with reading, with remembering, and how a book symbolizes all these things. Uh, in 1994, uh, I, I made a book work with Granary Books in New York. Steve Clay, the great visionary artist book publisher at Granary, proposed uh, that I, I design a, uh, a book which would be torn to be completed. And uh, I ended up producing A Passage, uh, that's the title. And, and A Passage uh, creates a book in which page number 181 is reproduced on every page of the book so that when I tore it according to this system to produce an object whose front cover touches the back cover, a wedge with a cross section of text, you can read uh, the page of text that I've performed that action on. And it's, it's a page in which I tell a story about my own life of uh, showing a, a friend uh, my work in the studio. Uh, the friend notices the torn books and, and it reminds him of a, a story from my days uh, in Hebrew school, uh, in which uh, we were told the story of a Talmudic scholar who knew who knew uh, the uh, the Talmud so well that if he pointed to a single letter in any word on any line of any page, this scholar could tell you what letter occupied that spot on every successive page of the book. Now, this was told to us as a as a story to encourage us to study harder, but but for me, it seemed so lavishly beyond that about an, another kind of knowing of a book altogether separate from understanding the implications of its text. Knowing it as an object in, in a way that was both fetishistic and obsessive and exalted and transcendental. And uh, the funny part about 
a passage is that if you point to any letter in any line on any page of that book, you already know what letter occupies that site all the way down. The same letter, because every page of that book is the same. And by picking it up and handling it, you can discover that it's not a miraculous coincidence that the story can be read despite the torn pages, but uh, uh, a strict system which reveals that operation. Uh, esta es una linda oportunidad en la que uh, me siento bastante orgulloso de ser primordialmente del lugar de donde vengo, de Guatemala y esta pieza que estoy haciendo que va a estar en exhibición en la Biblioteca Nueva de Princeton I was so lucky that I was born in a, in a home of weavers, my grandfather was a weaver, my father also and um, so from them I learned to make the little spinning uh, uh, the little spools for him, for my father to weave with. In my hometown, every year we have a fair, and at this fair they make this dance in the central plaza. Yeah, we call Baile de la Conquista. This is something new. Our weavings are totally different what, what we do there, and I try to incorporate some of those old designs with uh, the ideas and dreams that I have with also with the colors. In my mind I have you know the idea of the colors that I want that I want to play with but once I put one color kind of uh, pulls me to you know something that goes with it and uh, not that it's a perfect combination but you know, some colors really go with another. I was so lucky that two years ago, the government of this country gave me the uh, recognition as uh, an artist of extraordinary ability. I feel that this country is so... I can really see that what people say is that this is where you can really make your dreams true. I really am so thankful for that. I'm Catherine Hackle and I have a studio in Lambertville, New Jersey, and I do primarily custom decorative tile work. I learned tile work when I did an apprenticeship at the Moravian Tile Works over in Doylestown. I had done pottery work for oh, maybe 10 years before that, and um, it started when I was 13 in high school. I do primarily two different kinds of work. One is with red clay that I'll then use different hand-painted colorful glazes on. And then I do work which is a black and tan sgraffito work. Historically, red clay is a surface clay that has a lot of iron in it, and it fires at a much lower temperature. Those are boxes and boxes of red clay there. And then you put it on the slab roller to get a consistent thickness. Uh, and when it's kind of half dry, I then take my um, plastic panel, lay it on top, and transfer the drawings. One of the things that I like focusing on are different stories, and the, the tea set and the pottery work I often do, the Aesop's Fables and the, the different stories there, and that can expand forever because there's so many of the different Aesop's Fables. And the Princeton Project is another wonderful one in terms of looking into different Princeton stories. This is my little author. These are some of the illustrations, kind of as I originally pulled them together for the Princeton project. 
Yeah, I start in here. It's a lot of a lot of drawing work. Actually, I start in the library is where I start, and I pull out a lot of different books and a lot of different information. This is um, the Spitzer Space Telescope, named after Lyman Spitzer, in kind of a imagined school hallway, kind of university hallway. This is the Rittenhouse Orrery, which is I think a 1700s um, astrological clock, which is one of the few orreries that still exist. Lake Carnegie, different scholars along Lake Carnegie. This is a march by African Americans down Nassau Street from Princeton into Jugtown in favor of the 15th Amendment. And this is in front of the Horner House, which was um, the home of the people that ran the pottery in Jugtown that gave it its name, Jugtown. And it's thought to have a um, underground railroad access. There's kind of tunnels underneath the house that lead to other houses in the area. This is the Witherspoon School, which is in its, it's in its original building. It then later moved to a, another location, but this was its original site. This is the Rotolactor, which was kind of infamous dairy just outside of Princeton, Walker Gordon Rotolactor. And it was kind of cutting edge technology for milking cows and how to run a dairy. It was kind of a, a neat threshold in um, kind of old style agriculture to new industrial agriculture. The Dinky Train. I didn't want to um, repeat very familiar stories or very familiar images um, that are, are shown very well elsewhere in Princeton. I wanted to kind of pull out different stories and different things that were a little more curious and a little less familiar. How do people approach what I do? I think it's probably difficult. It doesn't really look like art. It looks like something else. Hopefully, people will be caught up in it because it doesn't look like art, but hopefully it will be engaging. If you have a questioning mind, not a closed mind, but you're curious, then you may want to go to the next stage and find out, well, what is this thing? And believe that someone's not trying to fool you. Uh, they're trying to say something about how words and language communicate in different ways other than just in books, how space can be used, how, um, um, how, you, how something can be presented in a way that you didn't know before. This is one of the things about conceptual art. One of the main points about conceptual art, I guess it was developed in the late 50s or 60s, and that was the notion of context. Where the work exists is as important as what's in the work. And um, part of that context isn't just the wall, isn't just the light, it isn't just um, the dimensions, it's also the, the, it's the entire situation. It's the future of the work. It's me, I'm the context. It's the people looking at it, they're the context. So that everything becomes the context. So it's reasonable to allow other people to contribute to the situation. And I don't think of myself as an artist isolated in the studio, just doing my thing. Part of my thing is to incorporate um, other people in it. And I'm sure that when people walk by it and start twisting their heads and wonder why this word is upside down or this word is on its end, and um, this is the kind of reaction that, gonna, that will, will happen. Words just do this because they're generated inside of us. They don't exist outside of us. You can't walk around and find them in, the, in nature like trees or flowers or birds or something like that. Um, so because they come out of us, they're deep inside of us, um, I think people 
some people who are uh, watchful um, will have a visceral personal reaction to them. I hope they do anyway. Uh, I'm Tom Nussbaum and I'm a sculptor and we're here at the Argos Foundry in Brewster, New York where they are about to pour uh, some of my sculptures for the Princeton Library. Um, they're going to be pouring the pieces in bronze. <laughs> A sculptor and I do uh, two kinds of work. I make these figurative pieces, painted figurative pieces, which I make in my studio and are shown in galleries and private galleries around the country. And then I also do a lot of public art uh, commissions and I do uh, sculpture that is specifically designed for a variety of different kinds of public buildings. And those pieces uh, use a variety of different materials, uh, stainless steel, wood, uh, paint. Um, the, the figurative pieces that I do, they're pieces that are about kind of a state of mind or an emotional state. Say one of the pieces at the library, for example, is uh, a bear, a large bear with a boy riding on the bear's back. And um, for me, that piece is a, a work about uh, kind of a father-son relationship. And that's, you know, what the work is about for me, but someone else may come to the piece and see or experience it, have a different feeling about it, and bring their own story to the piece and see it in a, and interpret it in a completely different way, which I think is good. I think what's most important is that my work is going to be in a public place. People will be living with my work for a long time and, in, and encountering it, and kids will grow up looking at these pieces, and um, hopefully they'll bring their kids back to the library and see the see the pieces and and it becomes a part of uh, someone's everyday life. Well I started welding when I was 20 years old and I was introduced to it by a friend who was a welder himself. He used steel rods and also sheet metal to create sculptures. So I asked him if he'd teach me how to weld, and he did, and I just took off. I just took off with using the rod. I just absolutely loved it. I loved being in the dark and the quiet and the focus. I love the focus. It's very necessary with welding because it's not only hot, but it's dangerous. So you have, I have to know exactly what's going on at every instant moment. My mind cannot wander. I like to go to a library and just sit and browse through different animal and, and bird books and different creatures will just come out. They'll just pronounce themselves to me. The killdeers make nests on gravel beaches right out in the open. And when a predator comes by to investigate the mother on the nest will leap off the eggs or the chicks and will go off to the side and pretend that she has a broken wing to attract the attention of the predator away from her nest. That uh, beetle looking creature on the wall is the first, um, it's the water nymph phase of the dragonfly. After their life finishes in the water, they creep up on the land and they will metamorphize then. Their back will open up and out comes a dragonfly. Just like a butterfly comes out of a chrysalis, the dragonfly comes out of this water nymph. Uh, this deer is made of mild steel and its name is Artemis after the goddess of the woods. And to me, she's a very spiritual piece. 
I am into nature because I grew up with parents who are who were were both naturalists and ornithologists, bird watchers to be specific. And uh, because of that, by osmosis, I absorbed this incredible love of the outdoors and of everything that is in nature. And as I grow older, it seems to be more and more imperative that we look and appreciate what is outside and appreciate it for giving us the life that we have and being one among many creatures in the natural world. I just wanted to, to write a story that recalled my childhood growing up in Harlem in the 1930s and going up on Tar Beach. And that was all I was trying to do. And as it turned out, it connected with the lives of a lot of people. Tar Beach, the first book Faith Ringgold wrote and illustrated for children, was a Caldecott honor book. Faith Ringgold's drawing for the cover of Tar Beach was fabricated in mosaic by Miyoto Mosaics. The piece is taken from one of Faith's pieces that was, uh, I guess, from her book Tar Beach. It was originally a tapestry. The tessera is all glass smalti, made in Venice. Smalti being a mixture of metal oxides and fine grade silica that is uh, tempered when it's made so that we could actually cut these pieces with a hammer, a hammer that has a carbide uh, tip. Everything is hand cut and the companies that we buy the glass from have been making mosaic for families for hundreds of years and the secrets of the color are all in vaults and they each have recipes for over 2,000 colors. We'll be back routing each piece of paper with cement. We'll put mortar up on the wall and we'll push the, the grouted piece into the wet cement. We'll beat it with a wood block. We'll get the whole thing up. We'll rub it to make sure everything is nice and smooth. So it's, it's, a, it's a real stressful thing because everything has to be right. The cement on the wall, the grout, uh, and it's just a, it's a lot of responsibility. All the most precious things we have in life, I think, uh, are connected to our hands. Each other, mm -hmm. bodies we embrace, children we care for. I mean, you know, I don't want to get, I don't want to bog down in sentiment here, but I think that because you can hold a book, the body gains a knowledge of it, which is unlike the knowledge you gain of other kinds of artworks. And, and this brings me back to the donor book for Princeton. You're not going to go into the case and read the book. You can read the book from outside the case. But, but you know that the act of reading is completed by holding. And in some sense, what it is a thousand people did, contributing money, energy, passion to the construction of the library, is you, something that you, looking at that book, identify with not only as a mind, but as a body. You could hold that book mm -hmm. in the same way that you are held by the library as you read it. And I, I think that that's ultimately what libraries are. They are this vast and extended metaphor of books themselves, you know, not just as indexing systems, but as that spectacular theater of, of language that we all learn about, first of all, when being read to by parents in the, in the shelter of someone's arms.